this morning, but I've had a I've had a great week, and uh, I got one of the greatest blessings I ever had this morning at about 8:30 when I phoned home and checked me some things. And you had uh, two Austrian nationals here a couple of years back, uh, Wolfgang Ottwanger and Mrs. Johannes, and we bought them a round trip ticket to Austria, uh, June, and they both went over there, and they're both back. And they've been teaching 20 to 30 people Bible over there, and they led 12 Catholics to Christ in, uh, in Bodischel, Austria. And both of them think the Lord called them over there permanently. When they finish school, they're going back over there as missionaries. Now, you're all too quiet this morning. Uh, I don't know whether it's the influx of the Auslander or what it is, but you're too quiet this morning. Now, you're really all just doing fine this morning. Now, you've got that Sunday morning free. I don't know what it is. It must be a Catholic hangover some of you have. You come along, odd dominus, fee fi full thumb and all this stuff. Now listen, you're the same person here, right here, that you were last night at 11 o'clock. So don't put on airs, okay? I mean, get the demons out of you when you come in here. <laughs> when you come in here, get all that trash cleared out of you. Have a good day. Turn off the news. <laughs> so I'll play a little hillbilly music here to warm you up. If you have a Bible this morning, let's turn to the first epistle of Simon Peter, chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. First epistle of Simon Peter, chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. Now, in first Peter, chapter 1, verse 18 and 19, the Holy Spirit has told us something, and He's told us that we're redeemed. And we're redeemed uh, not with corruptible things, such as silver and gold, received by the vain conversation of the tradition of your fathers, but by the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Now, you notice the word he used there. He says precious, the precious blood of Christ. Did you ever stop and think about what, what a vulgar statement that is? I mean, imagine to say that somebody's blood is precious. Valuable, precious blood. You know, modernists and liberals and atheists, they can't stand that kind of talk. And many of these new hymnals they put out, they take out the song to deal with the blood. They don't like the blood. The fellow said, the sight of blood and the talk about blood makes me sick. That old-time fundamentalism is a sickening thing, talking about the blood. Gus Hall, one of the former presidents of the Communist Party, said, if the Christians like the blood so much... Let them be spangled in their own blood at the altar, that kind of thing. He's a saphead if I ever walked one. Uh, the kind of people who kill people are not people that believe in blood. The kind of people that kill people are the people that don't believe in it. Isn't that a strange thing? We bloody Christians that believe in the blood of Christ to save us, we don't kill anybody for their religious beliefs. 
The bunch that kill them for the religious beliefs are the ones that mistake the blood for a wine bottle. You better get that straight, too. The greatest killer in the Dark Ages was a bunch of people who rejected the blood for something else, and the greatest killers today in China and Russia, none of them believe in the blood. Believing the blood of Christ is what makes you decent, and not believing it is what makes you into a murderer. You've got to get that thing straight. Now, he says it's precious. When you say something is precious, what do you mean? Well, you mean it has value to you. You mean it's worth something. When a mother talks about a little baby and says, my precious baby, my precious darling, she means the baby is worth a lot. Uh, what would you take for the life of your baby? Well, not, not anything. Why? It's precious. And when the Lord speaks to me as past about the precious blood, he's talking about something that's worth something. It must be highly valued. Uh, when I go to the rich section of my town I live in, Pensacola, they call it Mortgage Hill over there, and uh, up there where all the rich folks live, and you go up and down there and look at that place and see a spread there, see a layout. Uh, the guy's got three garages, you know, and an $85,000 boat out there and a trailer parked out there and a couple of cars and stuff. You look at that place and all that terrace, flowery and finery and all that landscape places and Japanese gardener done some work. You look at that place and you say, this thing must have cost a lot. I mean, wonder what this costs. This thing must be expensive. Now, when I pick up the Bible and open to the last two chapters and read about a city that's solid gold and has gates of pearl and walls of jasper, down here they fight over gold, up there they walk on it. I mean, when I see a layout, a spread like that, and it has foundations of precious stones, and the foundation, well, the thing is 1,200 miles square. If it's 1,200 miles square, it's like a gold cube. It's an inverted pyramid under one other pyramid. That means the stone, the precious stone, some of them must be 3,000 yards square. Pretty big diamond. And I see a layout like that, I say, what does all this cost? Must have cost somebody something. These precious stones, this uh, thing here, why, you couldn't just pick this thing up. This must have cost an awful lot. It did. It cost somebody's blood. And your text says you're redeemed by the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish. And without spot. The liberals don't like the blood. They want to get rid of the blood. Let me tell you something. When you get rid of the blood, you've taken the life out of your religion. Doesn't the Bible say the life of the flesh is in the blood? Or if you take the blood out, you haven't got any religion left. Take your blood and train it in for a jug of liquor and see what you got. You got a drunken religion is all you got. These silly little modernists run around. They have stick horse religions. There's a difference between a live horse and a stick horse. I mean, the live horse is an organism and has life. The life of the flesh is in the blood. But a stick horse doesn't have any blood in it. When I was a boy, we had stick horses. You get a broomstick, you know, and put a wheel in the back end and a horse's head in the front. And you, you know, gallop that thing around, you know. They've got, uh, they've got much more fancy things these days, you know, where the kid got the thing set up in the springs. He'd get up there and rock up and jump around. We had a stick horse. And that's what some of you folks got here this morning for religion. If you'll pardon my saying so, you got a dead stick. <laughs> you know what's wrong with it? There's no blood in it. The life of the flesh is in the blood. You people shouldn't object to the blood. You're bloody people. God knows that. Cut your nose and find out. How are you going to be saved by the little stick horse religion? You take the little stick horse religion, you know. Pretend he's horse. Giddy up, you know. You take him to church, you know. <laughs> Water him on the sacraments and run him around, you know. Put a wafer in his mouth, you know, and run him around, you know. You know, what the tr- you know what the trouble you is? You got a dead pole. That's your problem. Hey, Amen. Oh, I didn't, mean, I didn't mean that way. I don't know how it came out that way. Lord, I just don't know how it came out that way. <laughs> now you take you take that kind of thing. The life of the flesh is in the blood. When you drive by a wreck and look around on the ground, we know what you're looking for. You're not looking for broken glass. I mean, people are, they're they're hypocritical about those, especially unsaved people. I mean, the blood makes you sick. What do you watch the prize fights for? Some of you fellas sit around there 15 minutes looking at that glove, you know. Tip of that glove. That left glove, you know. You know what you're looking for? You look and see if it's shiny. It's got some blood on it. Do you ever hear folks say, well, I'm loyal to the red, white, and blue? 
or the good old red, white, and blue. How come you always say red, white, and blue? You don't believe the Bible, do you? Well, watch your language. Why don't you say the white, blue, and red? Why don't you say the blue, red, and white? Or the blue, white, and... How come you always say red, white, and blue? Because you can't be clean white till you've been washed in the blood red. You don't get to heaven blue till you're clean. Here a bunch of unsaved people going around giving the plan of salvation don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> Red, white, blue. That's the right order. That's it. You know, years ago we had a program called Town Hall Tonight. And Town Hall Tonight was a kind of a, uh, you know, it was a 1940 Johnny Carson show. And they bring people on there and interview them and talk for a good while or in an hour. You get a lot said in an hour. One night they had a panel. And on that panel, they had represented every shade of uh, religious uh, profession you could imagine. They had a neo-orthodox there, and a new evangelical, and a fundamentalist. And they had a conservative, and a dead orthodox conservative, and an apostate conservative, you know, and a, and a nothing air in. And they had all kinds of things on there. And one time in the middle of that broadcast, a layman, a Methodist layman, said to a Methodist bishop on that broadcast, he said, Bishop, would you tell us what the blood of Jesus Christ means to you personally? And that bishop gave a little talk on what people taught about the blood. And when he got through the Methodist layman, he said, I'm afraid you don't understand me, bishop. What I said was, what does the blood of Jesus Christ mean to you personally? And the bishop talked a while about the love of God theory of the atonement and the vicarious theory of the atonement and the governmental theory of the atonement and the propitiate went through that stuff. And when he got through the layman, he said, I'm afraid you don't understand what I said, bishop. What I said was, what does the blood of Jesus Christ mean to you as an individual? And in one hour of that program, that bishop never could answer. You know why he couldn't? Because it didn't mean a cotton-picking thing in the world to him. Just like some of you sitting here this morning. Some of you doctors and lawyers and physicians and college-educated people, you know what the blood of Jesus Christ means to you? Not one fool thing in this world. And you know it and I know it. You can talk about it, you can expound about it, but to you personally, there's no contact. And I'm going to talk for a while here this morning about what the blood of Jesus Christ means to me. And I'm going to tell you why the blood of Jesus Christ is precious to me. And you can look at this whole sermon this morning as a personal testimony, if you like, because I'm going to talk about why it is precious to me. The blood of Jesus Christ is precious to me. Don't you ever ask me that question that fellow asked a bishop and then not get an answer, because you're going to get one. All right, what does the blood of Jesus Christ mean to me? It's precious to me. Why is it precious to me? Well, first of all, it redeems. The Bible says, in whom we have redemption, through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. What's redemption? Well, redemption is buying something back that was sold. You ought to understand that when you go by a hawk shop. You go by a hawk shop, and what does it say? It says, unredeemed, unredeemed, unredeemed. What does that mean? I mean, somebody hasn't come in there and plunked down the money to pay for the thing, and the thing is in a hawk. Imagine a guitar, a Gibson guitar on the shelf of a hawk shop, and you come in there and say, uh, what you doing there? Oh, I'm getting ready to get off here in a while, and uh, I'm going to play you a tune. It isn't going anywhere. Shotgun hanging up there in the wall, what are you going to do? I'm going to shoot down some quail this season. You're not you're just going to hang me. You ain't going nowhere. You're not going somewhere unless somebody comes in there and puts some money down that counter and pays your bill and gets you out. And according to the Word of God, we're sold under sin. I was in the devil's hawk shop, and I was hung on the wall, and I was his property. And I could talk all I wanted to about doing something for God or being something for God or trying to be right or trying to be a Christian and this and that. But the truth is, I was nailed to the wall and couldn't get out. You know what happened? Somebody came in there one day and said, I... I want that, what you got there. The proprietor said, that's very expensive. And the buyer said, I'll take it. And the proprietor said, you don't know about that thing up there in the wall. It'll break your heart. And the buyer said, I want it anyway. And the proprietor said, what are you willing to pay for it? He said, you name your price. And the proprietor said, uh, well, I'll tell you what, I'll take your life for it. How's that? And the buyer said, sold. And got me out. I'm out of hock. You think it isn't precious to me? Ask me the question. I'll tell you. 
I'm not preaching a theological sermon. I'm telling you, the blood of Jesus Christ, to me, it's worth something. Precious, precious, precious. That's the right word for it. That isn't all. It justifies. The Bible says, being justified by His blood, not by baptism. We should be justified by His blood, not the sacraments. Justified by His blood, not by works. You say, well, James says, you don't know what James says. <laughs> I get sick and tired of these people running around and say, well, James says, you see how a man is justified? You don't see it at all. James is written to the twelve tribes of Israel. James chapter 1, verse 1, and the twelve tribes are not present here this morning. So don't worry about it. You're justified by his blood. A fellow said, what does justified by his blood mean? A man said, well, when a man is justified, he can say it's just as if I'd never sinned. Well, that's true legally. Now, sin won't leave you any better than it finds you. You'll always have the results of sin in your body somewhere. Uh, sin doesn't leave any man any better than it finds him. And you'll pay for your sins. You pay for them now in the sense you reap them. And you'll pay for your sins in the judgment seat of Christ in the sense you may lose rewards for the way you've lived as a child of God. But legally, officially, in God's sight, your standing in Christ is perfect, and you're declared to be just. You know, when a fellow serves time in a chain gang and gets out, he goes back to his neighborhood, and uh, somebody says, well, what happened? He says, well, the judge found it was a mistrial, and he declared I was innocent. Well, you go back and your neighbors don't ever forget. They'll talk about you the rest of your life. So, fellow, you know. He's over in Slam City, you know, playing rock hockey in the county pajamas. <laughs> I mean, they'll, they'll talk about you, you know, that, that way. <laughs> but, you know, as far as God is concerned, He not only forgives and forgets, but declares you're right. He doesn't simply say there was a mistake. The Lord says, this fellow is right. You're justified. Justified. If nobody ever forgives you, God will forgive you. If nobody ever forgets, God will forget. You'll take care of the thing and put the thing away. In 1864, a leading theologian that taught the groff wellhausen theory, that's the theory taught at the uh, Rock, Colgate Rochester Divinity School. God have mercy on your soul. <laughs> and that groff wellhausen teacher was at a meeting of famous theologians and was in a city in Switzerland where they met. And during that uh, theological powwow, when they were all trying to get together with an ecumenical smorgasbord, you know, and all go back to... Holy Mother, etc., and all this and that. Well, that mess was going on. It's been going on for years. Well, that mess was going on. Somebody said, one of those leading theologians, he said, you know, there's a man down here in the prison. I believe it was in, in Geneva. And he said, there's a man down here in the prison who's going to be executed in about a week. Would you go down to him and talk to him about his soul? And the theologian said, what's he being executed for? And he said, first degree murder. And the theologian was a famous theologian, well-known and well-read, had all kinds of theories and ideas he'd propagated through the years. He said, uh, no, I, I'm not going to talk to him. And they said, why not? And he said, I've got nothing to say to him. Well, there's something wrong with your theology. If you know where a man is right now who's dying, is going to be dead before 6 o'clock this afternoon, and he's coherent, but as you understand what I'm saying, I can go to that fellow and tell him how to get ready for eternity in less than 35 seconds. And you say, how? God will justify him. So I'll take his whole life and get rid of it and say, you're right, and let him on into heaven. On the basis of what? The precious blood. What could be more blasphemous than somebody going around talking about the confraternity of the precious blood? and the precious blood this, and the precious blood that, and the precious blood this, and the precious blood that, and trying to kid you into thinking it's a jug of liquor. What an obscene, vulgar blasphemy. Yeah. Amen, 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 amen. Any Episcopalians here this morning? Do you know what your articles say? <laughs> you ever read your articles, the 39 articles of the Church of England? Do you know what Article 31 is? Prince Charlie does. Diane does. You know what Article 31 says? Does anybody here know what Article 31 of the 39 articles say in the Church of England? Let me see your hands. What a bunch of blockheads. <laughs> There's one there. 
I mean, here's a bunch of Americans. Americans, mind you. Came over here, mostly English, English backgrounds. You don't know what the Anglican Church says in Article 31? I, I bet you know, I bet you know the teams in the major league and the NFL and the candidates for the Super Bowl. When it comes to religion, just as blind as a bat coming in backwards. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. Article 31, Article 31 says, We believe that the Mass is a dangerous delusion and blasphemous deceit. Does your Episcopal Rector believe that? But when your Episcopal Rector was ordained, he knelt down when the bishop laid on hands. That fellow took that thing as an oath to believe those articles and defend them. We're just starting. We haven't got anywhere yet. We're going to be a long way with it, you know. You say, I just don't think money should talk like that. Good. Then you sit quiet and listen, and I'll talk. I mean, I didn't send for you. You sent for me. And folks say, Amen, brother. Amen, amen, amen. I mean, folks say, folks say, well, I just don't believe in talking like that. You never have any sense anyway. I mean, you take Jesus Christ, he spent about half his ministry talking about things that were wrong. And if your preacher don't talk about something that's wrong, there's something wrong with him. Amen, amen. The blood is precious to me because it justifies. That is no, it blots out sin. The Bible says blotting out, bl- blot- blotting out the, the, the ordinances, the, the handwriting of ordinances was against us. Sometimes you get talking right at the same time, it gets complicated. When you go home today, sit down on a piece of paper and try to write John 3.16 while you're quoting John 1.12. <laughs> it blots out sin. Praise God, my sins are blotted out. You say, how do you blot them out? How do you blot anything out? You take a blackboard and put a bunch of chalk marks up there, and you take the eraser and go across and you blot them out. Where'd the chalk go? It went into the eraser. Christ blotted out my sins. Where'd my sins go? On Him. On Him. The Bible said, Christ bore my sins in His own body on the cross, that I, being dead to sin, might live unto righteousness, by whose stripes, by whose stripes I'm healed. Jesus Christ died for sinners. God made Him to become sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteous of God in Him. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being a made curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. One time a little girl was at a, a coming out party, a welcome party or something, where her mother was holding for a bunch of guests. And among the guests there was a liberal preacher there with his collar on backwards, walking around the guests, you know, and talking about this and that. And he happened to engage in a religious conversation, this little girl, who was a saved little girl. And he got talking with her about this and that. And she said, well, I know a good song. And she began to sing, you know, praise God, I can shout. You know, he blotted them out, you know, that little song. And she got singing that song and irritated that fella. And when nobody could check on him and see what he was doing, he pulled up alongside that little girl and said, God can't blot out your sins. The little ten-year-old girl said, I didn't know he cast him behind his back. <laughs> and the modernist said, God doesn't have any back. He said, well, the Bible said he put him behind his back. And the liberal said, well, what if he turned around? And the girl said, well, if he turned around his back, and still be behind him, and that's where my sins are. <laughs> I mean, I mean, sometimes out of the mouths of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise. The blood is precious to me because it blots out my sins. That is an all. The blood draws me nigh to God. That means to draw near, to draw nigh. It's the blood that gives me access to God. Uh, God made us and uh, we're bloody creatures. I don't know how many quarts of blood we have in us, but I know we got more than one. And it's going to take blood to save us. And when Christ comes and gets to Gethsemane, he sheds sweat drops like great drops of blood. I'm, I get near God by the blood. What could, be, what could be more precious than that? When I go to God, do you think I have to go through a battery of secretaries and a chamberlain and a front door and, a, and the SS and the CIA and the chauffeur? And the, what, I just walk right in the office. Down there in Pensacola, Florida, I've got a little school down there, and I have an office, 
and people have to get an appointment to come and see me, or at least knock on the door before they come in. Now, if one of my boys had trouble, Mike or David or Pete, if one of them had trouble and wanted to come and see me, they wouldn't have to knock at the door. They'd just open the door, come around and sit down. They're always welcome there. You know why? They're my sons. Did you hear what I said? They're my sons. Now that message Brother Savaka preached to you about the, you know, going to the Father? That's the business. I don't have to mess around with Hail Mary, Hail Joseph, and Blessed John the Baptist. Let them do their own praying. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. I can stand here right here and close my eyes and say, Lord, bless this message and save some soul for Jesus' sake. Amen. And I've been in the throne room. You still don't believe it. Well, that shows the kind of company you've been keeping. That Bible says, listen, let us come boldly to the throne of grace. Through Him we have access to God. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. We're seated together with Him in heavenly places. Candlelight said to me one time, he said, nobody can know whether they're going to heaven or not till they die. I said, boy, you got the thing wrong. I said, I'm in heaven right now. He said, well, you're not in heaven right now. I'm looking at you. I said, you're looking at my body. <laughs> Why, listen, the Bible says we're seated together with him in heavenly places. When his spirit contacted my spirit and gave my spirit a new birth, I'm part of him and he's part of me, and he's up there and I'm up there with him. When I walk in the throne room, I just open my mouth and I'm in. You see, who got, who got me there? Jesus Christ got me there. How'd they do it? Through His blood. That's why it's precious. Why, you know, before I was saved and was an Episcopalian, raised that way, we had a prayer book. And every time you got in a mess, you'd look up the proper prayer, you know. <laughs> you know, prayer for this and prayer for that. And if you got, you know, snake bit, this kind of prayer. And if you poverty stricken, this kind of prayer, and got a headache, this kind of prayer, and got trouble in the family, this kind of prayer. I've often thought about that since I got saved. I mean, wouldn't it be terrible if you're like Simon Peter and you're out there in the water drowning and had to get out your prayer book and go through the index? <laughs> prayer for a drowning seaman. <laughs> what if this building caught on fire right now? You have to look up for prayer for a Baptist about to burn to death in a church. <laughs> You saw a ruckman, you're being facetious and sarcastic. Sure I am, but it isn't dumb as some things some people do. Um, you ever notice that some folks get in trouble, they bypass Mary and go right to the head? Did you ever notice that? When a fellow's really in trouble, he doesn't pray Hail Mary, he says, Oh God. And you know it and I know it. When Walendo fell off that tightrope about three years ago, do you think he wasted any time with Mary or Joseph? He's falling down, screaming, Oh, my God! And that crowd on earth is scattering, yelling, Oh, my God! They know who to go to. The blood of Jesus Christ gets me into the throne room where I have access to the Father. It's precious to me. That isn't all. The blood of Jesus Christ is precious to me because it gives me the thing the whole world has been fighting for for 5,000 years. Peace. When Christ said, My peace I give unto you, not as the world give I unto you, let not your heart be troubled, he made it available for a Christian to have a peace the world knows nothing about. Uh, the world has a certain kind of peace, but it's always temporary. Sometimes it's a delusion. Sometimes it's a false peace. There's a peace the world has where you're in a concentration camp. And nothing can bother you because everybody's on equal footing and there's no class distinctions or anything else. Somebody's pulling you a leg. You get in a place where there's no class distinction, no discrimination, everybody treated equally, and everybody, all they've got to do is just do what they're told. The condition is called slavery. You may be working toward the wrong goal. Now, I have peace with God. What? The Bible says, quote, peace through His blood. Things between me and God are settled. Now, they may not be settled between me and my fellow man, and I might have problems along the way. But as God is my witness, if I had to lie down in the ditch tonight and die of radiation and fallout burns and die with my family dead and die in agony and pain in the ditch, there's one thing that's fixed, and that's the relationship between me and the Lord. I'm going to have to worry about a lot of things. I don't have to worry about going to hell. It's taken care of. With him and me, there's no, there's no problem. It's peace. Peace. You'd think a, a, a country or a world is nutty about peace as our modern world is, you'd think they'd be interested in the blood of Christ, wouldn't you? 
Isn't it strange? All these peace conferences, summer conferences, and peace in the Near East, and peace in the Middle East, and let's all work together for peace, and let's maintain the peace, and how can we have peace, and let's bring peace between... How come not interested in that? Peace through His blood. R. A. Torrey for years and years used to stand at the door of his tabernacle when he finished preaching, and he had a gold piece in his hand, a $10 gold piece. And R. A. Torrey would say toward the end of the message, I'm going to be at the rear of the tabernacle, and as you pass out, I'll give this $10 gold piece to any man who'll shake my hand and look me right straight in the eye and tell me you're happy without Jesus Christ. Nobody ever took it in 25 years. Now, they would today, because people today are crooked. They've degenerated. <laughs> Some guy now would do it just to get it. But back in those days, I'm say men had more character. And one day, when the banker was going out that door, Tory stopped him going out the door, knew he was unsaved. And he said, that banker said, sir, wouldn't you like to take this gold piece? And that banker looked him right straight in the eye and said, of course I would. But he said, no man could take it in the conditions you didn't name, went out the door. You know what that was? That was a confession that outside of Christ, there's no real peace. And there isn't. There isn't. You kid yourself. You sit down and try to exercise the power of positive thinking. You buy these books in yoga and sit cross-legged and try to pass out of it and pass in it, you know. And trip, you know, and attain samadhi and progeny, you know, and all this business and go to the Orient religion and try to kid yourself into thinking they've got an answer. The truth is, the truth is, there is no peace to the wicked, saith my God. The truth is, he that believeth in the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. You don't have peace. You may have fun. Fun, but no peace. There's no peace outside of Christ. Thank God for the blood. Why is the blood precious to me? The blood is precious to me because I have peace through it. I have peace through His blood. That is an all. The blood is precious to me because it purges. The Bible says, How much more shall the blood of Christ purge, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? I didn't fully understand that verse until after I'd been saved about a year. And after I'd been saved about a year, I preached in a rescue mission up in Greenville, South Carolina. And I didn't preach. I just actually gave him a testimony. And when I got through and went out the door, the rescue mission superintendent stopped me going out the door, and he said, that testimony had the right ring to it. I said, it ought to. I'm saved. And he said, you know, he said, Ruckman, he said, if I live like you live, better learn how to plead the blood. I said, What? He said, fellow, live like you live, better learn how to plead the blood. Blood. I said, I don't understand. He said, just plead the blood, brother. He smacked me on the back and left me. And I didn't fully understand that. It must have been about a month later. I was praying, just regular prayer, praying about the usual things. And I was kneeling there praying, and all of a sudden, some of those old filthy words began to come back in my mind, float around, and I knew something. I knew something. In my background, all kinds of goodies. I mean, among other things, a scat drummer like Dave Garner. You know, you sing and play at the same time. And you do learn these little ditties, you know. And I stuff again to run back through my mind, and I said, Lord, I, this stuff, I don't want to think about this mess. And I kept on playing, it kept on coming up. And I said, Lord, I'm through with that old life. I'm through it. I want to through with it. I get this stuff out of my mind. And I couldn't get it out of my mind. And just began to bother, praying, you know. I mean, you're right there talking to the Lord, pleading the, you know, petitions and. Lord, fill me with the Spirit and all this and that. And after a while, I just got desperate. And I said, Lord, I plead the blood. And boy, when I said that, that thing just went just like a, just like a, a breaker, a switch breaker going off. Bam! That thing was gone. I must have gone on that way for about uh, two or three months. And one time I was going across the campus, nothing unusual, just a regular day, regular problems and I was tithing, you know, and witnessing, winning people to Christ, and nothing particularly wrong. And I was going across that campus, and just about that time, some old pictures began to come back in my mind. And uh, I knew some old pictures. I mean, uh, you talk about something being precious. I wouldn't trade the blood of Jesus Christ for all the gold and uranium and plutonium in the universe. I mean, I've drawn some pictures in my day. And let me tell you, 
I went across there and those old things began to come back and I said, Lord, I don't want this mess bothering me. I'm through with it. And it kept coming back. And I said, Lord, this stuff is driving me crazy. I want to get out of my mind. And I pled the blood and it disappeared for about 15 minutes. Then it came back. And I got desperate. And finally, instead of trying to fight the thing and subdue the thing and suppress the thing, you know what I did? I took those old pictures and just magnified them, just blew them up like you're putting them on a giant screen. And I said, I'm going to give them to you, Lord. There they are. Just take them. You can have them. And just take them and soak them in the blood of Jesus Christ. Blap! <laughs> just like a breaker. That's something the shrinks in this town don't know. Why don't you try it? Think I'm pulling your leg, don't you? Think I'm just preaching, don't you? Okay, stupid, why don't you try it? Then talk, okay? I mean, proof's in the pudding, ain't it? You're empirical, aren't you? You're objective. You're existential. Sure you are. Try it. You think it doesn't work? Try it! Then tell me about it. The blood of Jesus Christ is precious to me because it's a present thing. Whatever that blood was or whatever happened, I don't understand all of it fully, but I know one thing. I know right now, standing here, the blood is available for a sinner. And I can appropriate it and apply it, and it will purge my conscience from dead works, what I used to do to serve a living God. What could be more valuable than that? That is an all. It cleans. It cleans. The Bible says the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. One time I was up in Bryson City in Tennessee and going along up there preaching, and I got bugs all over my windshield, and uh, they're smashed over there and some other goo. And I went by some uh, filling station. The guy came out there with a rag and worked that thing, and he got everything off except one spot. And he must have worked on that for 15 or 20 seconds with all kinds of fluid and Windex and everything else and couldn't get it clean, and I was inside the car in a hurry, and the guy kept fooling around with it, fooling around with it, and finally I said, uh, I said, try inside. <laughs> and he reached around inside the windshield and wiped that thing, and it came right off. <laughs> See, he was wiping the wrong place. And that's what folks do. They clean up the outside. They join the church, you know, and take their sacraments, you know, and get their baptism in their church, do the little golden rule, you know, and the little good deeds, and help the cerebral palsy fund, and the cancer fund, and the heart fund, you know, and all that kind of business. That's the outside. The trouble's inside. My little girl Priscilla, when she was about six years old, got in some bad trouble with me, and she was fooling with some ink, and I told her twice to leave it alone. And finally I told her, I said, honey, that's indelible ink, and that means when you get it on you, it won't come off. And I left her, and boy, about an hour later, she came in, or I came in and found her in the kitchen with a washcloth working on her dress there. And she'd been back in that stuff again. And as I came in there, she looked at me and she said, it's coming off, Daddy, it's coming off, Daddy, it's coming off. <laughs> I said, it's not coming off, you're just making a bigger mess than before. And that's what people do. See, they rub the outside. It's coming off. It's coming off. It's coming off. No, it's not. You just make it a bigger mess you had before. Listen, I'm talking about physics. I'm talking about something volatile. I'm talking about something dynamic. I'm talking about something that works. I can't break it down for you. I can't tell you how eternal life is in somebody's blood when they shed that blood. That blood went out like that because it was eternal and infinite and was still available and applies to electron. I can't explain it to you. I know one thing. It works. It works. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son. Why, why should God explain it like that anyway? The, the, that thing is for simple folks. I mean, just say the blood cleanses small sin, then try it. I mean, it better be for simple folks. God knows most folks are simple enough. All right, it cleans. That isn't all. It saves. In 1922, at the World's Congress of Religion in Chicago, a man from Boston, Massachusetts got up, and his name was Joe Cook. And Joe Cook got up after all the religious plenipotentiaries had spent hours discussing theology and discussing religions. They were all trying to get together, you know, in one ecumenical ball and get back to Holy Mother, etc. That's an old gag. They've been doing that for years. 
And 22, they got up there and got tried to get the Hindus with the Brahmas, and the Brahmas with the Buddhists, and the Buddhists with the Taoists, and the Taoists and the Mohammedans, and the Baptists with the Methodists, and the Methodists with the Catholics, and the Catholics with the Presbyterians. Now, after arguing for weeks, <clears throat> getting nowhere, they came near the end of the thing. And there was a saved man there named Joe Cook who had about all he could take. And toward the end of that thing, when it came his time to speak, instead of wasting his time going back over matters again, he got up and quoted a passage from Macbeth. And all he did was get up there on that platform and wave his hand and say the line of Macduff and wave that hand and said, How cleansest thou this red right hand? Now what he meant was to those fellows, I've just killed somebody, got blood in my hand. Now, how to get clean? Nobody could tell him nothing in that bunch. The liberals said, well, think beautiful thoughts and life will be beautiful. <laughs> that doesn't work. The Catholics said, well, if he joined our church and taken catechism and instruction, he probably wouldn't have done it. And if he'd done it, it would prove he wasn't a Christian to start with. That doesn't, that doesn't take care of it either. And the Buddhists said, well, get rid of your calm and sit cross-legged and pass out of the frame. <laughs> You know, the next time you come back, you may come back as a monkey instead of an insect. I mean, you can't, you can't, you can't get the thing fixed up. How cleansest thou this red right hand? I'll tell you how. The blood of Jesus Christ, God the Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Come now, saith the Lord, let us reason together. Though your sin be as scarlet, <coughs> it shall be <coughs> white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. That's how you get clean. You get clean like that. I mean, why waste money spending a hundred dollars an hour talking with some shrink to get bad, a, get rid of a guilty conscience when the Lord can take your conscience and clean it and take the deed and get rid of it and clean you up? Jesus saves. I know it sounds like kind of a trite cliche, and people get awful tired to look at it. They make fun of it throughout the world. King Kong saves and all this and that. King Kong doesn't save. Booty doesn't save. Where'd you read about Joseph saving anybody? Christopher doesn't save. Mary doesn't save. Hitler never saved anybody. Neither did Bismarck. Neither will Reagan. Neither did Roosevelt. Neither Abraham Lincoln. There's only one man that saves people. About Jesus Christ. Amen. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. Quote, for he shall save his people from their sins. Years ago, we had a terrible thing happen, <clears throat> and people forget those things pretty quickly. <clears throat> you take, there are not very many people here this morning that are worried about what happened to the uh, veterans in Vietnam. <clears throat> That's already gone. So I couldn't expect you to be excited about the prisoners of war in Korea that never got back, because that's even further back. <clears throat> it's amazing how quick people forget. Those terrible things people go through, they throw them behind them, the sun comes up, and the sun goes down, and life goes on. Life goes on some way. But years ago, in around 42, we had in the Philippines what we call the Bataan Death March. And there's anybody that thinks much about it. I mean, some of you probably never even heard of it. But you take when the Japanese came in to the Corregidor and took them prisoner, they took them up the road to Kamanatuan, up there to Camp O'Donnell in 42, then to the Penal Colony in 1943, and route to Japan, December 44, they were what they call the Tennis Court in Luzon. And finally wound up in Formosa, and out of something like 5,000 of our young men that went that march, 300 of them got back. 4,700 of them starved to death, or were shot, or beheaded, or murdered, or tortured to death. They made them bury them alive. <clears throat> God get too weak to put him in a hole and make him bury him alive. Men have always been wise to do evil, always been, and not wise to do good. You take in World War II, they had all kinds of ways of torturing them, and they still have them. And they took, they took them and beat the brains out with shovels and this and that. And they died. They died by the hundred. They died by the thousand. Some of our boys are high school educated boys. But they, weren't, uh, they weren't stupid. They were educated kids. Were down the whole of those ships trying to get each other's blood. No, no water for three or four days. God be afraid for his buddy getting near him. I, I mean, you live like an animal. You act like an animal. That's always of that. That old, that, old, that old veneer of civilization, it's pretty thin. I mean, some of us know how thin it is. I mean, when it comes right down, push come to shove, it's dog eat dog, man. And you take that bunch, they got down there just like that, and there was one fellow there on that 
In 43, that ship was on the way up to Formosa. By then, some American landing had been made. And about 44, that ship was plowing along somewhere up there north of the Philippines and south of Japan. And one night, when all the guards were drunk on sake, this fella got off the ship. Now, you don't come believe what I'm going to tell you. But this fella has been a pastor up in uh, Pennsylvania, uh, north of Reistertown, for about uh, 25 years, if he isn't dead now. And if you want to contact him for testimony, you contact Peter and John Bissett of the Arlington Baptist Church in Baltimore, Maryland. And the guy came in the church and gave the testimony. And here's what he said. He said that he was on that ship, and on that ship he'd repented of his sins a hundred times, and he said he was a Christian, but he'd been living like the devil. He was a Christian when he went to the Philippines, but he fell in with bad company. And now he accepted what he was going through as punishment for his sins. And one night when all the Japanese were drunk, he got off that ship and got through a porthole or something and fell down the water. And he got down the water and was so weak you hardly get to shore, but they were parked near an island, anchored near an island. And he came in with the waves and got on the beach and then fainted. And when he came to in the morning and the sun came up, the ship was gone. So he crawled into the jungle, and for a while he was too, too weak to do anything. And then he got messing around there and got some papayas or something in there and busted coconuts and got back on his feet, and then he ate some raw fish. And that thing went on there, and he, got, he recovered himself and just lived in the bushes like an animal for about a month. And one day he heard some noise, some racket on the other side of that island, and he went through the jungle, and first he was afraid to go, and then he decided he'd better go in a way and see what it was, but he'd better be careful because he, it might be Japanese. So he went through the bushes, and long about twilight, in order not to be spotted too well, he came on an outpost, and it was an American outpost. I'm an, Ameri I'm an American, I'm an American. Of course, you couldn't really tell. I mean, brown, lost about 30 pounds, just brown as a berry, beard, pretty hard to tell what it was. He gave his name, he gave his rank, he gave his serial number. He said, don't shoot me, don't shoot me. He said, I was subject to an outfit, I've been on the death march. He said, I've been here, I've been there. It's been so long, I'm almost home. Now, don't shoot me now, don't shoot me now. And he gave where he was inducted and where he was drafted and where he'd been trained, everything else. And the GI ahead of him said, uh, sorry, bud, so we got orders. And the rifle came right in on him. And the kid said, well, let me, let me pray for you, shoot me. Okay, but let me pray for you, shoot me. And the GI said, go ahead. <laughs> And he knelt in front of that muzzle. Don't you know that was a scene? And he prayed. Here's what he prayed. He said, Lord, he said, they're going to get me. He said, I'm not going to get back home. And I've tried to get back home, and you've helped me, and I appreciate your help, but I'm not going to make it. He said, now, Lord, I'm going to die. And he said, I'm going to have to see you. And he said, when I come up before you, there's something I don't want to have you do. Don't, don't remember my sins, Lord. Don't remember my sins. If you do, I can't possibly get by. Don't remember the, the bad things I've done or I can't make it. And don't remember the good things I've done because they don't count anyway. And he said, when, when I see you in just a few seconds, just remember the blood. And when he said the blood, that G.I. lowered the rifle and said, that's the password. Come on in. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I don't know whether he said it seriously or whether he got so shook up he couldn't carry out what he's going to do, but that's what happened. And the guy got in. You want to get in? Well, there's a password. And it's precious. And if you couldn't stand up right now in this building and tell me why the blood of Christ is precious to you, it's because you have made no contact with it. And if you ever had, you'd know exactly what I'm talking about. I bet some of you cats in this building haven't really understood a word I've said since I've started. For truth or no. You know nothing about the blood. You know, I get thinking about that thing sometimes. And I say to myself, isn't, isn't, isn't that something? Don't, don't you know the Lord's a character? I mean, the Lord knew he was going to save that guy and call him to preach. <clears throat> that guy passed at a church up there 25 years. That fellow, he thought it was all over, and the Lord knew it was just beginning. I wonder sometimes about that, what to do up in heaven when something like that happens. The Lord says, hey, Michael, you want to see something? <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> yeah, boy, he's sweating it out, isn't he? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, the Lord will chase one of his children, you know. He'll chase him. That old fellow in there, don't you know, his palms were wet, boy, and his mouth was dry. 
And the Lord said, watch, look at that, look at that, look at that. Hear that or something more. Things all over. Think going to get his brain blown out. Got 24 more years to serve. Uh, something. <laughs> okay, kid, say it. <laughs> you know, gave him the password. I read a story which you probably heard before, but it illustrates the point about a woman who went to a lawyer with a list, uh, a ledger with a whole bunch of names in it of people who owed her husband money. She wanted to collect the money, and she tried to collect it. And when the lawyer looked at the ledger, he said, you can't collect a dime of this. She said, well, there's something like $20,000 there altogether with about 40 creditors, uh, debtors. And he said, well, you can't do it. She said, why not? He said, didn't you see what he's done here? And she looked at the ledger real closely for the first time, and there was red ink drawn through those things there, all those places where the people owed him money. And the back of that book, there was a red line there to indicate what the red ink meant. And it said, this means forgiven, unable to pay. And he crossed out all the things there. And nobody could collect a dime, man, not a dime. And nobody can collect a dime on me. I'm forgiven. You know why I'm forgiven? Unable to pay. So I got somebody to pay for me. And that's why the blood of Jesus Christ is precious to me. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, bless the message this morning. May some soul here who wants these things come and get them today by faith. Not through some material means, but God is a spirit. May they, by faith, appropriate the blood of Christ. By faith, lay hold of salvation. There's somebody here this morning probably wants to be redeemed. They want to be justified. They want to have peace. They want the past blotted out. They want to be saved. And, Father, I pray they won't hesitate this morning. I pray they'll let nothing, nothing stop them from coming today and receiving the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. When they go home to sit down the meal today, may they know why you said what you said in this book when you said they're redeemed by the precious, precious, precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Amen. Let's stand to sing an invitation hymn. I'd like to have a stand to sing. You all know this hymn by heart. Now let's don't have body moving in and out while we sing here. Let's concentrate a little while. Pray a little while. Don't you want to see somebody saved today? Amen. How many of you like to see somebody this morning come and trust Christ? Let me see your hand. Amen. All right, if you're here this morning, you've been thinking about receiving Christ and confessing Him, you see where you are. You're among friends. They want to see you come. you got everything going for you right now. An hour from now, it may not be that way. An hour from now, it'll be the world coming in again. I mean, we take you to Russia for sports, we take you to Germany for sports, and now we go to Switzerland, and now we go to Las Vegas, and now we're down to Cuba, your mind just balled up and screwed up where you don't know where you're at. Now, you're here this morning, you know where you're at, you know whom you're among, you've heard the truth, now God help you to do something about it. Blessing just as I am without one plea. Wash it for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O land of God, I come, I come. Now, people down here in front of here to meet you when you come, have a word of prayer with you, and lead you to Christ. Now, listen, if you want these things, come on, get them. It's free. Isn't it strange? The only thing in the world that's really free, people turn down. Everything else has a hook in it. Got a catch in it. If a guy stands up and says this is free, you watch it every time with some kind of a hook in it. Now, this is the gift of God. It's free, no strings attached. It's unconditional. God saw all the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever, whosoever, believe it. Believe it. It's a spiritual operation. It's not a work. It's a spiritual operation. Believe it on Him. Should not perish, but have everlasting life. Let's sing the next stanza. Just I am and waiting not.
Can you understand how, how, how and why we say the blood is precious? If you ever hear me deny the blood of Christ, you'll know I've been tortured and that I'm insane. If you ever hear me deny the blood of Christ, you'll know somebody has taken my, my mind from me. No man in his right mind would think of turning down an offer like that. Amen. Nobody. Nobody. If I got my right sensibilities about me, I could say honestly, I wouldn't trade the blood of Jesus Christ for anything material or immaterial that exists in this universe. Because that's what's going to get me home to God in the right kind of condition. Precious. What's it worth? It's precious. It's precious. It's worth more than my wife, more than my children, more than my family. It's worth more than my own life, my own life. I'd be better off dead in Christ, covered with the blood, and happy and home in heaven forever with Him, than I would be alive without Christ, dead and trespassed in the sand. Precious. Worth something. Let's sing just as I am thy wilt receive. Come on while we sing. Step out, folks. Some of you want to. Now, one time will be all right to do what you want to do. <laughs> Lord, deal with you. Come on. Come on while we sing. Because I promise I this this morning before we sing one last stanza, and that's all we're going to sing. We're going to sing one more. Maybe we ought to go along, but I, I just don't like to press invitations. I feel like the Lord, if He's had His way with you and you're willing, He'll come. He'll come. Man is hungry and a hot meal is set before him. He'll sit down at the table. Don't need a whole lot of begging. We beseech you in Christ said to be reconciled to God. That's our business. We're not going to tarry all day. You know, you know what's right. I couldn't give it to you any plainer. If I could make it any plainer, it'd stand on my head. But I've, I've talked as plain as I know how. You know, you know what, I, what I, my intentions are. I don't know what yours are, but if you intend to receive Christ, you've got an opportunity. How many people doubted your salvation for a long time and never got any real assurance? until you rested entirely on the finished work of Jesus Christ. Let me see your hands. Would you hold your hand up high? High, please. Way up. Way up. All right, there are six, seven hundred people that had doubts about where they're going when they died until they did what I've been talking to you about here this morning. I'm not telling you to quit being good. I'm not trying to tell you there aren't good things about certain things in churches. I'm not saying that. When it comes to salvation, though, there's only one thing that will get you home. It's the precious blood. Amen. The precious blood. All right, let's sing one more stand. I'm going to close. If you have any intention of receiving Christ, this is it for this morning. Brother? Though tossed about, fighting and fears, sing it. Lord, speak in your heart. Come on. There are people here waiting here to help you out. Folks are hearing in prayer to you all, and consequently we'll prolong this thing just a little bit. It's inconceivable how anyone can turn down the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And really when you leave this auditorium today, you are making a decision. Either you have received it or you have rejected it. There's no middle ground. He came into his own and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. What we'd like you to do is slip out of your seat. What the Lord wants you to do is slip out of your seat come to the front. Someone is waiting here with an open Bible. And they will show you from God's Word how you can be a child of God, how you can be saved, how you can be redeemed, how you can be justified, how you can be cleansed. 
All of the things that you heard about this morning can transpire in your life as a result of just quietly saying, Lord Jesus, be merciful to me, a sinner. Come into my life. Come into my heart and soul and save me and clean me up. And I'm going to trust you and you alone. These folk are waiting here with an open Bible just to show you how that can actually take place in your life. Right from the Word of God. We're not going to show you anything but what the Bible says, what God says. If, on the other hand, you've been saved, never made a profession of your faith and trust in Christ, publicly do so. Perhaps you need to be obedient to the Lord in baptism. We expand the invitation to that. Perhaps church membership. Whatever it is that you need to come for, you come. As we sing this verse, come on. Instruments continue to play for a moment. All right, if we can have your attention for a moment, we'd like to mention the names of some folks that have come. Scott McMillan, Scott's 14-year-old young man. Scott, you were saved the 2nd of August. And you're coming and making a public profession of your faith and trust in Christ. You want to be obedient to him in baptism, is that right? Scott's mom and dad have come with him. Charles McMillan. Charles, you've been saved back in June the 14th. Is that correct, sir? And you'd like to be obedient to the Lord in baptism. Charles, you understand baptism won't save you. That's what did it. But it's, it's something that will honor the Lord, and I'm glad you're coming. And your dear wife, Sylvia. Sylvia, you've been saved. And you also want to be obedient to the Lord in baptism. Boy, it's good to see families do right. And then get saved, do right, follow the Lord. Thank the Lord for the McMillans. Amen. Miss Elizabeth, Elizabeth, Beth, Sheba. Elizabeth, you've come today to ask Jesus Christ to save you and give you eternal life. Is that right? You didn't ask this church to save you, did you? It's a good thing because we couldn't do it. You didn't ask the preacher. You asked Jesus Christ. He's the one that died for you, and he's the one that... I'm so glad you've come. Glory. John Bennett. Where's John? John, you're a college student, 20 years old. Today you've come to ask the Lord to save you. You learn more in the last five minutes, John, last hour, than you learned four years of college. I'm glad you've come. Amen. Thank the Lord for you. She's going to slip. Okay. We got another. Another decision here in just a minute. We'll report to you.
Andrea Tornabeen. Andrea, you were saved 11 years ago. That's what it says here. Is that right? You're coming looking for some assurance of your salvation. You want to know for sure? Well, the assurance is in the blood, Andrea. Andrew, you're blind with your eyes, but you can see with your soul if you're saved. That's the best kind of sight there is. It just isn't any better. Because that gives you eternal life. And someday God will give you new eyes. Amen. God bless you. Thank the Lord for you. You prayed so that you could get right with God. Well, God wants to fulfill that prayer too, don't He? <laughs> Amen. Bless your heart. Amen. Well, you folk that are glad that these have come according to their professions, just say amen. 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 All right. We had uh, you that are interested, 813 in our adult service here. Of course, today that included our teenagers. Uh, we had 22 visitors in this service. We had 1,298 in our total Sunday school this morning. Of course, some of you don't know, we have a, another Sunday school that follows this one. We've got a bus Sunday school that will start in about 45 minutes. And uh, they're going to bring in a good bunch of folk. And we thank God for it. We had 41 visitors today, totally. And tithes and offerings of $10,631.72. We had missions offerings of $2,502.21. So we had total offerings this morning of $13,133.93. Amen. Amen. Well, tonight at 6 o'clock. Now, here's what I want you to do. I'm glad Brother Ruckman recognized this thing. I've only been fighting this thing for eight years. You folks come in on Sunday morning dragging your tail a little bit. I've tried everything in the world to get you to wake up. Isn't that right? Amen. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you. You know, someday, Brother, I'm just going to forget having church on Sunday morning. We're going to do it some other time. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know when, but we're just going to do it some other time. Now go home and take your nap this afternoon. See there? <laughs> All right. And go out, to the, go out to the fruit stand and buy you a big watermelon. And sit down about 4 o'clock and eat you two good pieces of it. And take you a cold shower. And... Uh, Come in here wide-eyed and bushy-tailed tonight. And we're going to have a great service. All right. Good. Well, it's been a joy to see God work in these people's lives, hasn't it? Well, we had a good time last night, didn't we, men? Good bunch of men. Men's prayer meeting last night. We had lost and saved men there. And uh, I saw lost men getting on their knees and praying. It's interesting, isn't it? It's interesting. Well, let's pray and ask God to dismiss us with His blessings, shall we? Thank the Lord for Him. Brother John Green, red-headed John, pray for us, will you? going to use this for B Sunday School.